right. Okay, why don't we get started? So uh, we're very pleased today to have Professor Juliana Pacheco Duarte with us. Juliana is an assistant professor in nuclear engineering uh, at Virginia Tech. You have her bio, so I'm not going to read through it, other than the most notable thing, she got her PhD here from Madison in 2018. Three and a half years ago. Almost three and a half. Three and a half yeah, months. three and a half years ago. So she's going to be talking to us today about density wave instabilities, dry out rewet cycles in boiling water reactors during anticipated tranches without scram conditions, which is an interesting topic for boiling water reactors. So I'll turn it over to Juliana. Thank you. Thank you. And you didn't say that you were my PhD advisor. Also you advised me. Important thing. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, Thank you, it's really nice to, to be here. And this is, uh, I'm gonna basically, uh, half of the talk I'm gonna be talking about uh, boiling water reactor instabilities and oscillations, which is part of an NRC grant that I collaborate with the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, and also EW Medicine as a small collaboration in this grant. And then at the end of the presentation, I wanna talk and show a little bit of the experimental work and efforts that we are doing with attack that are also related to, uh, to the topic, part of the, the research. So I'm gonna introduce the two-phase flow oscillations that can lead to instabilities in boiling water reactors, two of the most common ones. Go to some CAT data that we are using to our, um, uh, into the, this research, uh, that CAT is a facility in Germany that has a boiling water reactor uh, that can run boiling water reactor full uh, rod bundle at full boiling water reactor conditions. And then show some of the data analysis that we are doing, um, some of the post uh, heat transfer coefficients that we are doing, and how that compared to trace simulations, which is a thermohydraulic code developed by NRC. And then again, some of our vision attack um, experimental efforts. So two of the most common uh, oscillations that we can have in boiling water reactors is the pressure drop type of oscillations and the density wave oscillations. You see this curve here of pressure drop versus mass flow rate. Um, you start here at high mass flow rate at single phase, uh, uh, single phase liquid. And then at some point when you start boiling, your pressure drop actually increases as you decrease with, uh, the mass flow rate. And this is for a constant heat flux curve. So all of this here is a constant power, constant heat flux. And as you start boiling and start creating volume in the core, you will achieve, uh, your pressure drop will start increasing. At some point in this curve, it is our own set of instability, which means the oscillations are gonna grow uh, from a stable to unstable point. If you are working with low mass flow rates, these, uh, the pressure drop are actually going to start decreasing now as we decrease the mass flow rate and increase the, your void fraction until you have your uh, film, uh, your vapor here, a single phase vapor at the, the bottom of the curve. The pressure drop oscillation starts they occur at this region where the pressure drop actually decreases as the mass flow rate, sorry, the pressure drop increases as the mass flow rate decreases. Um, the density uh, wave oscillations they occur on the other side of the of the curve, where the pressure drop now it is increasing with the mass flow rate uh, increase. And again, you're going to have a stable region for the same power level. And at some point uh, here, uh, point D, it is our own set of instabilities. Why we are interested in this topic? So density, uh, density wave oscillations. What we're going to focus here because that's what we observe in these ATWS conditions, and especially in the experiments that were commissioned by NRC in Germany to study the Malaplus boundary conditions in a, doing uh, anticipated transit without square. What that means? The Mela boundary basically allows boiling water reactors to operate at higher pressure 
uh, that they were originally licensed for. So they are all operated at 120% of the original license uh, pre, uh, power. The MEL plus boundary, it is now uh, pushing this limit here to 100%, 120% of the power, but at lower mass flow rates in the core. And this is a boiling water reactor, which means that you have two sides flow, which means that if you decrease your mass flow, you could achieve uh, a region of instability. So NRC actually had performed some simulations using the trace and park codes. And they observe that during anticipated transit to dice crane, if you're operating high power and lower mass flow, that could lead to instabilities, and the instabilities eventually could lead to what are called dry outs and rewet cycles, or CHF and rewetting. That could lead to a failure to rewet and potentially damage the rocks. So because they observed that in the simulations, they wanted to know what happened in the experiment. What happened if we now are performing these experiments in a facility at boiling water reactor condition? in a full-size bundle. So they've done that back in 2016. Uh, they run a bunch of pressure drop experiments to characterize the, the grid spacers. They did steady states, critical heat flux experiments to uh, also characterize the, the facility. And then they use this natural circulation loop here, which has the tax section, the Dalcomer, uh, uh, water steam separator here in the top. So it allows this loop here to work as a natural circulation loop. Uh, and during the natural circulation, they uh, change a few things in the experiment to lead to the instabilities. What things that they change? They had two kinds of experiments. Uh, the experiments without the void uh, feedback coefficient system means that they were, they're controlling the power. So these are electrical uh, heater rods. So they basically apply current to the rods and they increase the power uh, they apply in the rods. And if they don't have any simulation of their voice fraction, voice fraction feedback coefficient, the power is completely controlled by who is running the experiment. And as they increase the power, they, they lead to the oscillations that they lead to instabilities and they lead to the failure to rewet. And then after we see also the thermocouples oscillation, oscillating between dry out and rewet. So I'm going to show you how this data looks like. This facility also has the capability based on the experimental conditions to simulate the void fraction in the bundle and use this void fraction to change the power as we have a, in a real reactor when the void fraction affects the, the, the power. So the experiments with void fraction feedback, they are actually simulating this void fraction and changing the electrical power that they apply to the rods. In this case, the power will oscillate and the, the conditions that lead to a failure to rewet, that leads to a dry out conditions that we cannot recover anymore, occurs at the lo lower power levels. So just to, yes. just for everybody's clarification, she shows in the cartoon the BWR test vessel in, and the PWR test vessel. But what's interesting about this, this is a full-scale BWR fuel assembly. So there's no scaling in terms of the size. It's a complete fuel assembly. Sorry. Yes, I, I think I have this, the, the picture of the rod bottom here. And it is not only for scale, it's like a 10 by 10, uh, rod bundle. We have different power peaks to, sim to actually simulate the rod bundle. We have a power profile. We have a full length uh, uh, and partial length rods. And you have like a water channel, everything that sim mimic a boiling water reactor bundle. Um, I want to show how the data looks like, but this is also from the experimental data just to understand what the density wave propagation, the density uh, wave propagation oscillations, they, they occur because of the, la the time lag between the void form formation at the inlet or the coach to the inlet of the bundle until it's achieved, it 
the the end of the bundle. So the, this time lag causes a time lag between the inlet flow and the pressure drop across the test section. So this test section has a lot of instrumentations. We imagine pressure drop uh, along several points of the the uh, the bundle, and we can see through the data the shift into the uh, inlet mass flow rate and the pressure drop across the the test section. So basically, the pressure drop delays is introduced by the density rate propagation, which increase, which means that we increase in the inlet mass flow rate, results in a decrease in the local void fraction, and then a decrease in the pressure drop. We got a question on the, yes. on the inlet, that uh, purple curve, the bottom curve, is that introduced? Is that, a, is that introduced to the system this way, or how, how do you start the wave? We so the this is the inlet mass flow, right? So the things that they were varying besides of the power was the water level in this system here, which we actually this is all proprietary, so we don't have access. But as we increase the power and generate the two-phase flow, we start generating these oscillations. So it's, it's, a, it's, we, it's an experimental uh, condition. We, we achieve the two-phase flow, and then we start having this feedback, yes, okay. oscillations. Okay. So just, just for clarification, a BWR always has oscillations to some little bit extent. Yes. And so what she's looking at is when these little bit of oscillations then grow in amplitude and, and essentially start exponentially growing. Wow. Yes. Thanks. And uh, Julia, I think that's one for the clarification. Just one second. You're showing that the you want to operate the VWR at a lower flow rate at a higher power. But why is that? Why this? Yeah, why do you want to operate between V and V on that graph? I'm not sure if I got the question. Um, so you can go back one more again. Go back to the So this blue area here. Like we were trying to operate at these low void fractions or these high void fractions with this low power. So high power, low flow, high void fraction. Mm -hmm. Why do we want to be in that regime? Good question. I this is what the, the industry wanted to do. I think I so think, I think it's a practical matter because now from a fuel cycle standpoint, for fuel savings, you would prefer not to move your control rods, you would prefer to change your flow rate so that you you economize in terms of neutrons. So, because if, if you notice what she has here, if you go down to 100% power, at 100% power, they can vary the flow rate without moving rods. When they've now upgraded the reactor 20%, now, based on the old stability curve, you have no ability to move rods. You have no ability to change flow. But by expanding the, the operating flow window, you can still do the same thing you did at lower power, which is move essentially your flow rate without moving rods. In a BWR, it's the most interesting thing when you're in the control room to see these guys work because it's a complicated balance between flow changes and, and control rod movement. And you want to pre-plan all of this ahead of time. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So it's economic reason for the industry, right? Uh, so this is basically what has happened during the oscillations because we are pushing the experiment to, uh, to have the oscillations. And this is how the data looks like for the experiments without the void fraction feedback. So the power is controlled by whoever is running. Uh, uh, early on, you see the small oscillations or the battery this is going. The, the small oscillations in flow always exist. And then we increase the power by steps until we we get the power and the oscillation starts growing without us changing anything. And at this region here, at some point when these mass flow oscillations are large enough, uh, the amplitudes also lead to the oscillations of thermocouples. And these are thermocouples measurements into the rods. And what you see here are uh, increases of 40, 50 Celsius degree, which also indicates CHF. So we are actually going to the CHF, we are creating this film uh, vapor into the wall, but as the mass flow increases, 
the wall is reacted. So we have the flow oscillations, the chemical oscillations, and at some point when the oscillation of the mass flow are high enough, actually, even though the mass flow rate increases, that's not enough for you to recover because the temperature is way beyond the minimum film body temperature, which is the beginning of the, the film body. So at this point, the surface is too hot for the water to contact, and then we have to actually shut down the experiment and force the re wet to occur. And one of the questions that we're trying to answer is, uh, what are the instability conditions here, and what are the conditions that lead to this uh, oscillations. If we have the, oops, this is with the void fraction feedback, the mistake there, uh, the power is going to also grow in the oscillations. So in these experiments, since they are not controlling the power, the average power is kept the relative constant, they are the, actually changing the feedback coefficient so they can increase the effect of void fractions and forces and it should grow and force the, 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 the instead to achieve a region of instability. So this is just an amplification of the end of the experiment when we actually see the power increasing and decreasing by 10 to 15 percent. And this is also the point where we achieve the failure to wet one or more thermocouples uh, does not decrease and then we have to shut down the experiment, decrease the power, and force the rewetting. I'm going to basically be talking about the first kind of experiment that we have already analyzed. So one of the first uh, steps was to understand what is the criteria that define what is stable and what is not stable. What is an unstable solution, what is an uh, unstable, unstable condition. So we found that for these types of dry density wave oscillations, what leads lead the unstable conditions and is when the pressure drop of a bundle or the outlet pressure of a bundle, it is completely out of phase with a mass flow. And this is like the theoretical view of this. So you have a leaf mass flow and we see the density wave changing the pressure drop along the, the channel. And once the pressure drop is completely out of phase, then the effect of the pressure drop is actually a negative friction effect. And the increase in the mass flow <coughs> will, uh, they're going to have a positive feedback, the mass flow and the pressure that are going to lead to this increase Actually, the other picture was better to see that it can lead to this increase of the mass flow oscillations and she cannot recover anymore. Uh, so we basically looked at all the data uh, and calculate what is the phase change between the pressure drop in the bundle with the inlet mass flow. And then we could define at the point when they were 180% out of phase. And this is like an unstable condition where this is leading, is growing uh, slowly. Some experiments are growing faster. And this is a, just an oscillation condition that is not growing. We have used a couple of models, existing models, to see how the models fit uh, and how can predict our instability condition. The first one was Ishii's model where it's basically solve uh, the drift equation for two phase flow um, by separating the channel in these four different regions. So we have at uh, the beginning of the test section with, without an heater, the heater single phase. The lambda here is an important parameter where we have starting having uh, vapor into the core. The initial model actually he ignores the full boiling so the lamina is actually when the temperature of the liquid achieves saturation temperature. And then we have a two-phase flow heated region and our two-phase flow unheated region. If you uh, solve the drift model and we assume a perturbation at the inlet velocity of that model, we can also 
uh, we can understand how these waves are propagating and um, solve the two phase flow equations for the, the problem. So the perturbation, they have an amplitude and a, a oscillation grow. In this case, the, the grow actually we control it, so we don't uh, use that into the, in the modeling. And we use the same frequency as the experiment to simulate the, this perturbation at the inner temperature. I don't need to go to the test of the boundary condition, but there are some important assumptions in the Ishi model that does not consider subicoolant boiling. And. Can you say that louder again, please? The Ishi model does not consider subicoolant boiling. So it's a simplified version. And that's why we did this ha Saha model, too, which does have the subicoolant model. They're going to show the results. Um, the liquid is assuming compressible. The pressure, uh, the average pressure, it is assuming constant, so it does not affect the properties of the liquid. The density waves oscillations, they also don't account for the vapor compressibility, so the vapor is uh, also incompressible, uh, and, and so on. So we solve that model at the end of the when we put all the drift equations together for the four regions, we end up in having the pressure drop, which is gonna be a function of our flow and the, the perturbation in the velocity. This Q here function, that is our characteristic function, that is gonna uh, give you the instability condition. So we did that assuming a uniform power profile, to be easier to solve, and then we actually use the power profile cut facility, which uh, predicts the inform uh, the instability conditions at a lower phase change number, which is related to the power of the bundle. Uh, I don't have the numbers here, a lot of plots gonna be hitting the numbers because of proprietary uh, re reasons, but our experimental data was just between these two points here. So it's just between the non-uniform profile, which is not ideal, but was close enough to the model of Ishii when we actually use the power shape of the bundle. Uh, we use Saha and Ishii data. Uh, can, can, can I ask a question yes. about the previous slide? Sure. Just so I understand. So, so this is a dimensionless. This is a dimensionless um, number. power yes. number, primarily in the bottom. Yes. And then the the uh, y-axis is this stable, unstable. When I go from essentially in phase to out of phase. Yes, but using the solution of this characteristic uh, equation. Okay. Yes, that's Ishi did not use the. Um, the phase change between the drop, pressure drop and, and the flow oscillations as a criteria. He uses his pressure drop um, equation for the channel. Yes. And how good is the uh, characteristic function? Does, it, does this model get very close to reality or is it an approximation to the general behavior or somewhere in between? Well, if we call, it is a, it is the pressure drop in the channel. So we call characteristic function basically, uh, I think in comparison to the contrary theory, when you have a perturbation and everything is multiplied by a perturbation. So when these terms go to zero, it leads to instability. I think his question was, is what's, how, how good is the model relative to reality? Yes. Um, good enough. I show the results. Okay. Yeah, but it's a it's a drifty model, which means that uh, we are only assuming uh, the the velocities of the 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 vapor and the liquid as we are calculated through a correlation. So we're not solving the two the completely two phase flow problem because that should not be, be not be possible to be done uh, this way. Right. Only through simulations. 
Okay. Um, so we also uh, use Saha and Zuber and sometimes Saha and Nishi because they collaborate together model, which the main difference it is to include the subcoolant volume. So the lamina that tells us the length at the point from the inlet to where we start having void fraction into our uh, channel. So the lamina is our single phase length, which is also oscillation, oscillating with the, the mass flow rate. We're gonna occur uh, earlier in this model once we start assuming the subcoolant volume. So we don't need to go to the equation the what it change is going to be basically the shape of the vapor generate, generation rate into our uh, channel. Instead of having like all single phase and then volume, we're going to have the vapor generation occur earlier into the volume channel. This is the proposal uh, equation by that. They end up having a simplified version of, of this equation. When you compare this to model, and that's not our day yet, the main difference is what is happening at the bottom. So the boundary conditions by she follows the asymptotic curve at the low subcoolant, whereas the non-equilibrium boundary, which is this black bar, uh, have a curve towards zero uh, at uh, low subcoolant and high at phase change number. And the phase change number is the definition right there. So at low so cooler, the non uh model predicts higher so, uh, uh, subcoolant number uh, for so, uh, phase change number ratio at the instability boundary, which you're going to see how this affects our analysis. Okay, yeah, this is how we <coughs> did most. Uh, compared to our data. So here we did use the phase change between pressure drop and the inlet mass flow to define what is an unstable condition to a stable condition. So these black and red dots are the data from CAT facility um, at seven bars. So we have a few other data that are at 80 bars that are not included here. Uh, the issue models, which is the, the that assume equilibrium between phase, they go to zero here, and they are on the conservative side of assuming why it's an unstable condition, while the Saha model that assumes it, now the semicolon volume, we kind of approach to our experimental um, Boundary between uh, unstable and stable conditions, so instability condition. The green one here is just a, a simplified version that we proposed at some point, and this the blue one is just another SAHA simplified criteria. Other questions? So, so I, I guess I, yes. I want to make sure I understand. So, at a given pressure. To the left of this can't happen because I'm not boiling. To the right of it, it can't happen because I'm all vapor. Yes. And in between, I'm looking for the demarcation between stable and unstable behavior. And and the the four different models are just four different approximations on that demarcation. Yes. Okay. And then this is basically what we are right now. We are seven months into the pro the project. But the what we are proposing now. We did improve this model here to better predict what is happening in terms of the volume void fraction into the vapor production into our channel, or this all has uncertainties. We, the drift model is not perfect. We can do a bunch of simulation using trace or all the software, but it will actually have to, to define what is uncertainty boundary along this line that are reasonable enough for LNRC uh, that this model are good with these boundaries, right? So this is one thing that we are proposing. Yes. Uh, did you compare to see if the transition is actually the unstable and stable is related to flow pattern change? The flow? The 
because maybe you're changing from low to late to, I don't know, slow so pattern or something, and that's called stable. Um, stable. This is a good question, but we are all very high quality in all of these, I mean, okay. not here when we're far away here, yeah. but when you get from these points here, I don't think there's a so pattern. Yeah, if, yeah, if you're in like a charm flow, then it's a very different charm. That's very unstable. To, to ask his question differently, yes. what's what do you think is the volume fraction, the void fraction when we're at this at these boundaries? Are they is it high or low? That's what I don't. It have. is high. It's high. It is very high. I don't want to give a number, but it's it is high because as soon as we have the dry out, we are dispersal. So I say uh, we we start in this low flow here. Okay. Yeah, it can be the churn. As this churn is flow. The churn is very unstable. It's the, like, the transition between slug and land. Yeah, that's not very good. Well, that financial flow is very unstable well, and large pressure. Yes. But the yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, see, I see your point. We definitely have to check what are the, the, the flow regime maps here in the all of these, but the I think it's, we're talking more about a <coughs> local yeah. instability instead of like a system instability. Maybe I don't I don't know how that gonna fact actually is these boundaries. Good. If somebody online makes a question, Tim, we're gonna read. You want to ask Tim if there's questions online? I'm watching, and I told him. Oh, you were watching. Yeah. Okay. Definitely make sure. Make it less complicated. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of things that we are still doing here. And but but let me let me ask Tiago's question a little differently, just to make sure I understand. At, if you use Ishii's model, which is an equilibrium model, for so if I have subcooling, I have zero quality, and then if I have any. I could predict with drift flux the void fraction. So you could lay on lines of constant void fraction here, answer this question. Right? Yes, yeah. we can. But I'm guessing, my guess is it's very high void fraction. We're talking 80, yeah. 90 percent. Yes. So I don't think there you'd always be an annular flow. So I think most of this is occurring in annular flow. That's, that's a guess on my part. Yeah, it's, it's very high void fraction. Uh, so, as I said, this is uh, our flow instability. We haven't touched the power stability yet, but we started doing a comparison with trace model, and our University of Illinois is going to do trace park simulations to compare with the CINOP data that has the feedback coefficient. When you compare, um, when you simulate the data trace, uh, we see that trace does a really good predictions in, in uh, uh, the CHF and when the actual temperatures start oscillating. And the main difference between the experimental data here in black with this the trace is that the actual experimental data uh, with the thermocouple measurement, actually we have used the inverse heat transfer uh, problem to find what it be the surface temperature in contact with the liquid vapor. The experimental data is always stayed in the transition body, never fully recovered. As in trace, we achieve in CHF, but the transition body is not a physical modeling uh, that is there. It's like a, a inter interpolation between CHF and the moving body temperature. So trace simulates the does not simulate the transition well, and you always go to CHF and a fully recovering the temperature. Why in the actual experiment, we always stay in the transition body. And then at some point, it's finished in life. But then, um, yeah, then the power decrease and we, uh, we rewrite the temperature there. When you look to the heat transfer coefficient, we have done that for uh, all of the data experimentally. We haven't compared everything we've traced yet. So we've done some of comparison. The intern predicts, and that's only the end of the transient here, when you to the left, 
The intent produces a slow degradation of the transfer until it achieves the film volume vision. While trace, um, this is the last cycle here, predicts the fast degradation of the heat transfer coefficient, and then it stays in a very close film volume heat transfer coefficient. So, so just a question. So the black line is just taking the data that you have and back calculating the H. Yes, we, we use the inverse heat transfer, okay. calculate the surface wall, use the local power to calculate the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, and the red line is what Trace's correlation is saying? The red line, yes, it's what Trace simulation with the same conditions. So. Okay. So that's, we, we, I think I have a next slide. Uh, the CHF, I, the, I, I can go to the slide. The CHF uh, power uh, in trace is, uh, predicts it very well the cat facility CHF. So in order to compare the local heat transfer coefficient, I have to force the CHF to occur at the same location of the experimental data. So I can have the same local power. Uh, yeah, same uh, local power, but otherwise I'm not comparing the same thing. So when you do the total power of the bundle, the trace cup predicts pretty well without having to make any adjustments, only the same side. In order to simulate the CHF at the same location, you have to do some CHF multiplier in trace. So when a force happens in the same location, I can see what has happened at in the transition body from body point. It, and it is a small which I do not have much. I'm gonna put the, the number here, have it into the, the paper. But then in the transition body, what is most affecting the relax now it is the mean of body point. So I have done this sensitive analysis with numbers that are actually closer to the Grunewald and Stewart model and to the uh, homogeneous population temperatures, the two models that NRC have been using uh, to, to predict the reality. So we have the experimental data here in black. And if I do the T minimum to uh, low, the failure to react is going to occur before the experimental data. If then I allow the minimum to go higher, then the surface temperature allows it to go higher. And since they're going to be still close to the transition body, I'm still reacting. And then at some point uh, here, we have like these um, two numbers here, 200. And 20 and uh, 627 that are covers the before and after the experimental data. So we are seeing that the 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 transition to film volume point is also affecting our capability to predict when this is going to react or not. Yes. I do. Like if we were talking about a, so standard trace simulation with the CHF in a different axial location? Yes. So you're, you're increasing the CHF multiplier in the other areas such that it doesn't occur there or decreasing it in the other area? I, I end up being, so I don't remember, I think it was a higher than long CHF multiplier. But what I'm doing is just forcing to occur because they are predicting uh, I'm forcing to occur at the same location. By increasing the CHF multiplier at other axial locations or by decreasing it in one? The CHF multiplier is for the whole. Okay, so you have a single constructed geometry for all that. Yes, that yes. What I wanted to make sure that I have the same local heat flux at CHF. Uh -huh. So I can compare the heat transfer equation at the same like void fraction and same. Uh, uh, heat, local heat transfer, heat flux. And then we have to uh, manipulate that and to observe or compare the other parts.
so what we're going to do next for this, uh, uh, this uh, we are starting now looking to the power solutions and the stabilities when the power is varying. The transition volume heat transfer, they said we actually calculated the experimental heat transfer for all of the data, and we observe that when we have this failure to rewrite condition, we can see a stable film volume uh, region uh, as the heat transfer efficient is not changing for some time. Um, and that is it's maintained constant until we have the uh, the shutdown, the experiment, the power decrease, and the rewrapping. So we see we can see here what is the transition as the heat transfer is changing, and what is the film volume as the heat transfer it is kept in, as, uh, in a almost constant uh, region. Um, and, and we're gonna define the criteria for that to happen, look into the transition volume for this position. And at the end, I still analysis to propose, since we are doing all this project in a non-dimensional uh, form, where we are non-dimensionalizing everything, we wanted to also propose ways to reproduce these oscillations and, and uh, instabilities in a different scale. So, so the upper right is is that essentially the value of the purple at when it's flat? Yes, this is the film volume. Okay, so that's the that's the actually calculated from the experiment. Yeah. Okay. And I have for the other experiments as well. I just put a few of them it's long Um so just to change a little bit of the topic uh, to show things that we're doing uh, experimentally at the vision attack. The first thing that we did was the quench experiments are very nothing uh, different than other universe has done. What we did different was we installed optical fiber into a quench rod uh, to measure the temperature uh, while it's quenching throughout the whole length. Our rods were 30 centimeters long, 20 centimeters that it quenched. We had Manel, Manel stand still, we hit up, up to 600 Celsius, and we quenching so we could observe the transition volume, the fume volume, the transition volume as we quench these rods uh, and, and see the temperature measurement at the age 0.6 millimeters. So nice thing that we could observe that was different from what other people has done was that we measured the axial, uh, the axial heat flux into these rods and they actually are very compatible to the film body heat, uh, heat, heat flux. Uh, so it's a significant axial production when we have these, these kind of experiments. Uh, I have a question. I'm just looking at your cartoon. Okay. So, so the thermocouples are at the outside? No, they are inside. We put in three thermocouples uh, so we could calibrate the fiber at from 5, 10, and 15 centimeters from the bottom, and the fiber covered the entire length. Oh, I see. Uh, and the fiber was inserted in the middle. We had okay. a tube yeah. tube of stainless steel there to insert the fibers on. But we will measure the maximum temperature during the transients, uh, plus or minus the, a little bit of air that was uh, into the Kepler tubes that was affecting the transient. Where is the heater? These were oh. heated to a ceramic heater. We heat up first and then we just punch it. So we have this ceramic around the raw, achieve 600 Celsius and drop it to the water. High speed camera, and everything else was similar to others. So the actual production is a steel more than it is. No, we quench only the raw. But you said there's axial conduction. Axial conduction in the raw, in the clad. In the clad, okay. And, and also here, uh, most of the clad, yes. This is a BN, uh, bottom of dry fill, but with the most of the conduction is in the clad, yes. You can see a clad in the end. Stainless steel and a auto fiber tube into the inverse heat transfer. 
Um, so so yes. I, I'm, quite, I'm dying to ask, can you do this at pressure? Yes. Not well, I'm going to show that while okay. we're doing your, your, your plenish there. Um, just nice pictures and videos. The high speed camera I, most of you have seen before. And this is the optical fiber of the calibrator. And we can see the quenching from propagation from the top to bottom and from the bottom to top of the optics, bottom to top and top to bottom until it's fully quenched rod. And here you're just seeing the quenching um, propagation from bottom to top. Uh, other nice thing that you could see with the optical fiber is that there's a large uncertainty in the quenching temperature that we are measure depending on where you put your thermocouple in the rod. A lot of this experiments uh, has done with one thermocouple or two or three, uh, but depends if you put it close to the edge or, or the center or close to the top, the edge you see it. Of your bottom, we can have 80 degrees difference on what is a quenching temperature for the same roughness, same cladding, same uh, subcooling condition. So there is a large uncertainty, uh, depends on the axle location. In this figure here, we're just showing the thermocouples and the fiber uh, measurements. Uh, and the greater difference between the transients between the center of the rod and the thermocouple position. And here we see several of the fiber measurements for the same experiment, just showing quenching at different temperatures. At the same, and these are the things that we are trying to control the roughness of the surface, the subcooling of the water tank, and the, and the material of your cladding. Uh, so when you present the, 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 the data, instead of having one minimum feeding body temperature or quenching temperature, we can actually show the temperature of the rod along the 20 centimeters of rod that we quench. And we see, for example, in this case, for high speed coolant, the range of the quenching temperature actually gets higher, have like a large uncertainty of when that will happen. Depends on the axle Other thing that is nice is that we don't have to use the high speed camera to calculate the quenching phone propagation velocity. We can use the fiber optical, uh, optical fiber directly to see how fast the quenching it has happened and that gives us the coverage to do that at high pressure. Uh, we have used some machine learning to analyze this quenching. Uh, this is just a flow ch charge of the train process because we have um, data from the entire fiber so it's like hundreds of data points for each experiment we use each data point as one quench experiment so we could use a large set of data to train our machine learning and reproduce this quench experience uh, so the some of you might be familiar but the machine learning you basically are putting your data into trying to fit it in a model and you calculate the cost which is different of a model and your data and you try to uh, fit that to a cost that you say that this is good. So if it's not good, you use weight functions to change your model. If it's good, you accept your train data and then we have another set of data to compare with the data that has been used to train your model. So that's a very brief description. But we try with different ones. We try using the multi-layer perception model, which is basically the neural uh, 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 perception with uh, these hidden layers inside, the random forest that 
separate our data as trees, and then we can uh, predict using each of these trees and get an average of the model. And you see here that we're actually predicting the quenching curve. So we're actually predicting the temperature as a function of the axial location and our condition. So that's someone now 10 cells to be some cooler for different axial locations and the MPL model did quite well to predict our own data. And then we ask what are gonna happen if you use this same model trained with our data to predict other people's quenching data. And surprisingly quite well. So we chose these two papers here that uses the iron chrome aluminum alloy because we have Inconel and Monel cladding and the thermodiffusivity of this alloy is there between the Monel and Inconel thermodiffusivities. So we are not extrapolating our model, but interpolating to predict something else. When we use our model to compare their data, the NPL, which are the, uh, the closed squares and closed dots, are predicted with a plus or minus 5% of their quantity data. So, I, I'm, I'm, can I just ask? Yeah, that? sure. So, none of this is your data. This is all prediction of other people's data. This one, yeah. This is our data just for the. Okay. Uh, and MLP is just a group of experimenters. And um, MLP is our is our prediction. Um, which is like a perception. Model. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm doing too fast because the time. Okay, sorry. And the P and B it is the Bajar and Parkinson correlation. So we actually use our training, uh, machine learning, and that correlation to compare to the measurement. Team of Xeon and Canva. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah, I did very fast. Um, and it was, as I said, it was good, but because we are interpolating uh, the the model and not extrapolating. So if you extrapolate, the uncertainty is going to increase quite a lot. Uh, I think that's the last. The second. Uh, thing that I have only two slides to show is that now we are building a high pressure annular flow facility uh, that we're going to add this far optical fibers in, and, uh, and when we also can study transition volume, which which flux, and thin volume, and, and do our own control experiments. So the facility, uh, it is a typical uh, two phase flow facility, we have a high pressure pump. We have a test section. We do have a steam separator to avoid, so we can control our oscillations, a condenser, and a pour. And I think our accumulator for pressure control is not in this drawing. The main difference here is our, our test section. So our rods are actually instrumentated with seven chemical bolts and three capillary tubes that now can measure the temperature along the one meter heater length. We're using optical fibers in three different uh, angle uh, positions. And we designed the issue to, have to go to 18 megapascal, uh, PWR uh, uh, mass flux, and 100 kilowatts of power, which are going to be very high for like a one meter length of the heater, heater rod. This is doing COVID. We have a lot of delays into the experiment and in the to the deliver the equipment. But we are building, so we will open the test in the spring. We have a rod, we have a zirconia and an inconel rod. Uh, we are getting the cooler and condenser this month. The high pressure pump is gonna be in December, and the other equipment are uh, already there. So this is the team for the NRC grant. I said Professor Tomas Kozlowski at University of Illinois and their students. 
Professor Mike Curtin is also collaborating. I have my postdoc that has done the machine learning training, my PhD student, my MS student, mainly work in the high crash facility. And that's it. And that's after COVID, first <laughs> meeting <laughs> of my group. I think I have five minutes for questions. You may want to turn to the outside one. So we have one question and the other person has to leave. So they'll email you separately. <laughs> okay. Uh, from Argon. But, um, I don't see here that she sent to you or? Well, they had their hand up. And they were going to ask a question. Oh, okay, so just. Gone, Ibarra. Uh, so I have a question for you. Um, yes. And maybe this is a. Uh, Maybe this is well known, but why do you have different quench temperatures in different states? That's not very well known. We're, we're surprised about the, uh, the like how different, because we initially thought that the axial conduction could explain what has happened. But we did the full uh, 2D inversely transfer to account for axial and radio conduction, and that did not explain. So, so the knee of the curve is has a gradient to it where you would have expected it to be flat or not as not as steep of a gradient. Where the knee occurs. Where, where the where the bump changes is is a function of length. Yeah. Right. Or, excuse me. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So the the, the slope of that of the top of the rod to the bottom of the rod. It's going from about 300 C to about 300, well, 280 C to 350 C, which so, is surprising. Yeah, it was surprising. And my assumption is, uh, because the team in models, they assume, oh, it is a thermodynamic pro problem. If it is the same pressure, we have the same community. Although it's not, because if you change the surface, that's an effect. But it might be also a hydrodynamic problem where whatever has happened, with the the thickness of the film boiling and the bubbles that we are creating is affecting how we are reacting this, this surface. And it's just quenching at different temperatures, which are quite high. You see the 88 degrees of coolant, we have a very high range of temperatures. Yeah, so right. just to just if I understand like quenching is that when the water like liquid water contacts the rod? Yes. And uh, so it quenches at a higher temperature if the water is colder, it's like Yes. It quenches higher if the uh yes. That's the surface temperature of the water. The quenching the surface temperature leads to the cool the temperature of the water, yes. That, was that expected, I guess? That... Yes, that is expected. We kind of know for the, we kind of know well, not well, I'll say. We know the fact of quenching with the temperature of the water. The mass, this is a quenching experiment, so we don't see mass flow effect. It's a completely whole story. The pressure effect, we know that exists, but each model gives us a different prediction of how the pressure affects. Which you cannot see in these experiments is all atmospheric pressure. But uh, we know the fact of temperature, we know the fact of roughness. And recently, some people here at Madison and other universities are doing the fact of all the different kinds of cladding too. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We measure as time goes on, uh, the temperature does not change. Doesn't we put up like the like variance here on the, this temperature, but the tank is large enough that uh, there's a small variation. Other questions? Other questions?
Any I, questions online? You're talking to the moon? I'm talking to the moon. I don't know listening. if the mask, how well the mic is. Are we? Oh, here we Which microphone are you? I'm using the wrong. I think everyone can hear you. <laughs> Somebody think you'd have complained. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think they need to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. So is Tim still monitoring us? Or Tim's is on, yeah. Oh.